Yes, hello folks, welcome to the weekly Manchester United podcast. I'm your host as always, Phil Brown, joined with my regular co-host, the excellent James Road on this Monday morning, of course, after United's draw 2-2 with Liverpool. Uh, we'll talk a lot about, of course, what happened in that game. We'll cover a little bit what happened in the Chelsea game, the continuing discussion around Eric Ten Hag's future, um, some of the talking points in that game, some of the things that were we were talking about on social media last week about is Ten Hag's training methods responsible for a lot of the non-contact injuries that United are receiving. Um, I'd, uh, we talk about um, what the uh, summer will look like as it's progressing. So first of all, mate, how you doing? Pretty good. Not bad. Yeah. Could be worse. <laughs> That's a decent day. <laughs> yeah. It's funny because, you know, when we recorded this uh, last week, we'll be interested to see where we are a week from now with this Chelsea yeah. game, with Liverpool game. And the similarities in all those games, you know, just unbelievable. Um, United didn't win any of the last three games, despite being ahead in all of them. Going into the last 10 minutes, and in some cases, nine, 10 minutes into injury time, still found a way to throw these games away. Um, first of all, what was your take on yesterday? It was, um, it wasn't as good a performance at all as the cup game where I thought United were actually pretty good for stretches, um, especially in the first 20, 30 minutes. And then, you know, from about 80 minutes on through extra time and all of that. Um, I thought it was, it had some interesting similarities though, because Liverpool were all over them for quite a while, but failed to convert chances or failed to convert their chances, you know, over and over and over again. And, um, it, it kind of let United back into it, which was the same thing in the cup game, you know, with, with everything that went on and where it ended up. In the cup game, Liverpool also had so many chances they failed to convert, so many opportunities they wasted uh, that they kind of slept on and let United back into it. And I was kind of surprised to see them do it again. Uh, and then, you know, they gave uh, Kwanzaa, gave Bruno an, a gift with that pass, which he finished brilliantly, mind you, yeah. but an absolute gift. And it's 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 kind of incredible, United, when you look at how things have gone because – I don't know whether they're lucky or unlucky. I honestly don't. Mm -hmm. I, I have no clue what this team is anymore, whether they're fortunate to be where they are or unlucky to be where they are because Chelsea gifted them goal right back into it also. It was a, a simple pass across from Caicedo right into Garnacho to put him through on goal to get United back into it. And in both games, they kind of springboarded off of that emotional high of getting that goal, of finally like the confidence. Mm -hmm breaking through to turn around and put something onto it um, before failing again. You know, Brentford, I thought they were awful. The entire game was probably the worst game of the year. We discussed that. But but these two games, you know, they kind of rode that goal to get back into it, only to have it fall apart again uh, just a bit later. Um, yeah, I honestly don't know. When you look at the numbers, the team is bad, like really bad by the numbers. Uh, bottom half of the Premier League bad right now by the numbers, but they keep ending up in positions where they probably should be winning games and then not winning them. I honestly don't. I, I feel like I don't learn anything any well, when, this when I watch them anymore. <laughs> it's really hard to tag any type of it <clears throat> because whatever you yeah. whatever you say, there's always a contradicting stat yeah. or something. When you try to pin something on them, they're this, they're this, they're this. I mean, there was times this season where we were complaining about the fact that they couldn't score goals, neither scoring goals, but they can't defend. Um, and you're, you, 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 there are certain things that have stayed with United all season, and that is their vulnerability when they score. Um, yeah. There was at no point at two one where I felt that game would end two one. I had no mm -hmm. confidence they would see it through. I felt that they will gift Liverpool away back into this game. Yeah, and they did with a penalty. Both goals come from a set piece. Uh, unforgivable. The first one is totally unforgivable. I mean, it mm -hmm. is. See, there's the things where you know when I talk about direct criticism of Ten Hag, there's something that I can pin on the monitor. And that's twelve of them this year, by the way. Because I'm looking at this and going, it shouldn't be that complicated to organize, you know, in defense. 
Mm-hmm. And I understand that you know, when you're doing zonal marking and you constantly have change, it can be confusing. Right? There's, there's zonal, zonal to man in some sense because you know who picks up who constantly changes. But when you're looking at these games where they're conceding goals, look at the, the goals they scored, they conceded against Chelsea from set pieces. I mean, the last goal they concede is 4-3 from a corner. All week you're focusing on is we cannot fall asleep on corners. We yeah. cannot give these types of goals away at this level. Yep. Me, you know, if Liverpool scored 30 yard, fine. No score a worldly, fine. But this is yep. unacceptable. And then you see shortly after this, Liverpool have another corner. And you can see man who's confused as to whether he should be picking up Luis Diaz or not. And what you see, teams, you see this a lot at United, is there's nobody organizing back there. There's nobody taking control and saying, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. And taking control of the situation. You need a leader at the back that projects calm, that organizes. When you coach kids at 9, 10 years of age in defense, Santa backs. You teach them to communicate. You, mm-hmm. teach them, you, know, you make sure we don't get caught one from out the back. Make sure there are certain things that it doesn't matter how good you are. You don't have to be the best player in the world to be organized with set pieces. Like these are the basics of football. And if you're going to concede goals like this every week, you shouldn't expect to win games. Football these are such bad goals to give away. And yeah. then, of course, the first half performance, man. Was I'm not going to say 18th century football. I'm going to say non-league football. Yeah, because I agree. it was so atrocious, so bad. What you had was the same thing over and over again. Nana either going long out wide, or the centre backs going long out wide. The second pass, the transition into midfield was never available. They're too slow coming out from the back. There's no movement ahead of the centre backs in midfield to where they actually want the ball. And so they end up a couple of square passes, they're knocking it long out wide and yeah. turning the passion over yeah. because it's way too predictable. So they were relying on teams to make a mistake to find the space to cut you open because they can't yeah. do it through their own patterns of play. Yeah, correct. So this is what happens on counter-attack in teams is you catch a team a mistake, you and you exploit the pace, but space, but when you are a team where you are doing that, you can't control games, you can't control possession, and you need it almost never control possession. Um, I, I mean, it's always the opposite. It's always surrendering possession, hoping to catch you on the counter-attack. The other things that concerned me was Casemiro. Mm-hmm. Casemiro was atrocious. Gave a ball away 16 mm-hmm. times yesterday. It's, 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 yesterday. And does something in the very last minute that you expect from a kid. 95th minute, and he flies into a totally unnecessary tackle. If that ball goes in, you tend not to take responsibility, but I'm looking at that going, why is an experienced midfielder doing something so mm-hmm. stupid on the edge of his box in the last minute? I mean, is he doing this, is he doing this deliberately? Because right. there's no for that. I mean, that's the one thing that experience teaches you not to do, is do not give away needless free kicks in, in areas that you know high body needed on set pieces. This is this is so poor. We talk about game management. I mean, I expect more from someone like Casemiro. And you know, he'll have a major, major problem because I don't think I seen him break into a sprint yesterday. No, and no. it's kind of been that way most of the season. Every time I've watched Casemiro play, I I sit and I wonder can he even run anymore? Yeah. Like, is he actually capable of it? I'm not sure. Um, and and yesterday seems like a marker because we've been talking about the concerns of it for a while. And I think I got at least 12 messages from people who are at the game saying it was one of the worst performances they've seen live in their life from him specifically, that it was one of the worst individual performances they've ever seen. That he was mm-hmm. all over the place, more even than you see on TV, that he's just in nowhere land all the time and completely off the pace of the game. Um, and that's seriously concerning. Uh, I think it's, I, I honestly, I, it's, it's confusing. I mean, uh, obviously it highlights a bad transfer strategy at the same time, you know, last year United were looking at um, something we talked about quite a lot. We're looking at replacements for Casemiro. They couldn't afford it. They were looking to try to do some loans with options to try to get some better players in. 
players we've talked about, like Amadou Onana and Ezekiel Palacios and these names, because they, I think there's an awareness that Casemiro is not up to the pace anymore. And <clears throat> it's probably, I mean, it's a huge problem. I, I think that there is validity in that the way it's set up doesn't help the situation for him because it's so much space for him to cover and he can't. I, I think it'd be hard for a lot of players to cover the kind of spaces. I mean, you know, last year it was much more of a two very often when Christian Eriksen or Fred was playing where they were a lot closer together. You know, they would be defending together. Eriksen was often sitting kind of deep and covering the gaps. And um, this year it's a, it's a bit more aggressive and open in, in the middle, but even still, he's not probably half the player he was many times last year. And, and that is a, a serious concern. I, it was, a, it's a weird game because individually, I don't think for most of the game outside of Casemiro, when anyone was even particularly that bad individually, um, you know, like throughout the course of the game, there was a lot of decent performers, um, I think it's obviously worth mentioning, you know, Willie Kambwala coming in for his first home oh, start. Yeah. Oh, he was oh, fantastic. Oh. I mean, he obviously has the physical traits, the aggression, uh, and the head for the game. He does. He, 100%. He's, you know, a raw prospect still. But coming in to the situations he hasn't performing, you know, uh, that's why they bought him a long time ago, seeing that that potential in him to be at that physical level to, to compete in this league, which is something desperately needed, and we'll talk about more. But – that I was, I thought he was great. Uh, I thought he was fantastic. I thought um, overall there weren't really, I wouldn't say any bad performers pretty much outside of Casemiro on the whole throughout the game. There's obviously mistakes when it comes to things like the goals and, and all that that happened, but yeah, just a, a kind of a frustrating you know, one. I look at this, DMs. And I'm just a scrote. I'm a football fan. So, you know, I don't have the forensic knowledge that obviously people like Mitchell van der Gag have, Eric Ten Hag have. They clearly understand football, right? On a level I never will. But I'm looking at United, and to me, some of the flaws are obvious. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe, I mean, Eric Ten Hag has to see the same thing you and I see. I mean, they're forensically looking at games you know, on video afterwards, looking at positions, looking at where players are supposed to be, where, um, you know, so so what, the shape that you see on the field is not an accident. That's mm -hmm. not because yeah. players can't play a certain way. It's, the, it's because of how they're being asked to play. Yeah. And I look at how many times uh, Kabi Manu was ahead of the ball yesterday. A lot. Right? And there's no, they're not compact in the middle. Because there's massive gaps even between the players in the same positions. You know, Manu yeah. and, 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 and Casemiro are miles off each other. Yeah. And the defense, as we said before, sit deep because they don't have electric pace. Although Kambala does have pace, which I, I noticed yesterday. Um, yeah. So there's huge gaps there. But there's a clip floating around on the internet. I saw it this morning, which was quite interesting, where, you know, typical Dutch, but Ten Hag is in a, a Dutch television, you know, studio where he's sitting with Blue Hullet, a couple of other um, uh, uh, Dutch football personalities, and they're looking at his Ajax team. And Hullet is talking to him about the gaps in the middle and how, you know, Fernandinho at City sits and controls the midfield for them, how Busquets did it for Barcelona. Um, and if you look at his Ajax teams, like when you turn the ball over, the gaps are too big. You can't have this. This is and Ten Hag's trying to explain why they do it and understands the risk involved. Uh, I thought this was really telling because it was going. So even if you need to make a bunch of new signings this summer, it's very possible we're going to see exactly the same thing we're seeing right now with in terms yeah. of you because this may not be as a result of the fact that United don't have the players to play a certain way. What we're seeing is a consequence of direct instruction from Ten Hag. And I'm sorry, but you cannot be conceding hundreds and hundreds of shots yeah. because basic law of probability says you're going to concede. You're going to concede penalties because yeah. the opposite yeah. is spending so much time in your box. If you need to defend the lead, you have to be able to, you know, you, if you look at the Chelsea game, they go, 
as soon as Chelsea score, you need to throw 40 players forward. They can see the corner as a result of that. And mm-hmm. they fall asleep on the corner. Two goals yeah. in a minute, which is just unbelievable naivety. Where, yeah. you know, foul players lay down, run the clock down, you know, put the ball in the do do all the dark arts just to get the game over. Yeah. They're not that's not there. They tell players to sit deep, to, you know, stay organized. I just it, it seems to me such naivety, but obviously Ten Hag knows more about football than I do, but I'd love to really sit down and listen to him to have him explain to me why they are shaped this way. Well, yeah, I agree. And and I think that this is this is pro- there's two things that are probably my major concern about it. Number one is, you know, there's a lot of things that Ten Hag has very, very valid uh excuses for. And and I don't mean excuses as a negative, I mean valid excuses, right? Um, things that are outside of his control, things that are um are the way that they are. However, that exact point on that midfield is is not an accident. It is 100% intentional. It is, you know, when, when people will ask, we're not seeing how Ten Hag wants to play. In some respects, you are. You're seeing exactly how he wants to play in certain areas of the pitch um, because that is how he's set up. Uh, at, at IX, very much the same thing. And at IX, it was the same complaints with a lot of looking at him as that... Um, you know, the, the issues in transition specifically when you turn the ball over, there was huge gaps. But they would go score a lot of goals to kind of um, press up on that. But there's another issue, and I think that this is the biggest issue, and it is a valid problem in transitioning between leagues. Um, there was a post the other day uh, and that I that I read, and, and I've read it before and seen it before, talking about the transition between leagues, like when players transfer from one league to the next. The worst league to transition to the Premier League is the Eredivisie. It's the worst one. And the reason for that, if you speak to people, which I asked about this on, uh, on uh, you know, people who are from there, and I have some, some good friends and, and people I speak to that are very much focused on, on the Dutch League and, and live there and, and all that. And the way that they explained it is, of course, that what you get at a place like Ajax and in the Eredivisie is a really heavy focus on technical players. A lot of technical players, right? A lot of skillful players. You can see that. You watch the league and watch the players come from there. They're technically skilled. But they actually, in some respects, almost have pushed down and looked down on players who have physical traits, who are more standouts from a physical traits. It, it's not something they value. Even when Virgil van Dijk was there, something they didn't value as much. And when you're not dealing with a highly physical opponent, the gaps are less important. They they matter less because you can beat them with all your technicality. And even though the gaps are there, you're probably not facing a team that's going to have better athletes than you at any point in time. Um, and uh, and and that's a, a bit of that transition, and from from there to the Premier League that nobody does it. I mean. Well, that's Arsenal. interesting because you know Ten Hag's getting criticism for being too intense in training. Yeah, well, what I mean by the the intensity of it is is the is the yeah, and we'll talk about the player specifically. We talk about like I think he's recognized that in some respects, and and I think that plays into the injuries. But I think we'll keep that as a, a whole topic because it's a lot. Yeah, to we'll get into that for bit, sure. Yeah. Um, but in terms of like the setup itself, that there's less you're you're less used to. You know, you don't get players of the caliber of athletes that you have in Liverpool's midfield, like McAllister running through your midfield uh, elsewhere. And, you know, it's something that I think a lot of managers have had to adjust to, and it's just whether you get time to do so. Will he adjust to that next year? Would he go more compact next year? Would he change how he does things? I don't know. You know, when you look at the purchase of Mason Mount, you, you really have to wonder, because, he, you know, he's come on the last couple of games, I understand from an injury standpoint, but you have to wonder how does he fit into this? Because he's not going to be a deep midfielder either. So it's another 60 million, you know, price aside, but it's another player put in there that when Kabi Mainu is playing, where is he going to play? Is, is is Mount going to be way up there now? And you're going to still have these big gaps. Mm-hmm. And I think Mason Mount is actually a really smart, intelligent player. Mm-hmm. But I kind of look at it that his only role is to replace Bruno Fernandes. That's that's the only thing I can see. And um, that's a, it's a little bit of a sideways move rather than 
you know, a move at rounding out that midfield and fixing it. So, you know, that midfield and, and structurally, I think is the biggest concern I would have, you know, with Ten Hag and it's kind of secondary that comes with that is those shots conceding because, you know, Diogo Dallo and Juan Bissaka giving away penalties in two consecutive games, all the shots that are being conceded. I mean, Brentford should have scored seven last week. Uh, Liverpool could have scored a lot. You do make mistakes the more you defend in your own box and giving up so many touches in your box and defending for so long and so intensely thing. It is the lot, like you said, it's, it's, it's the law of averages. And when you, when you, when you play the numbers, you're going to lose at some point. And so that's why I say sometimes, I don't know whether they're lucky or unlucky because based on the amount that they face, I would almost say they've done an incredible job, not conceding more than they have and being in these games in the first place. Um, but then at the same time, getting unlucky with bad mistakes at the end of them. But, you know, when players are tired, uh, when they have to do things so many times, the more it happens, the more mistakes are likely to occur. And, and those are the two things I'd be kind of worried about most you, of all. You know, I was trying to think the other day, I'm like, how many games have you seen United this season totally dominate? Yeah. I think of one. Right? I know you can look at the West Ham game or the Everton game, you can look at the result, but the result... <clears throat> is not suggestive of what actually happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't matter, and I'm talking about Newport County too, it doesn't yeah. matter the level of opposition. United aren't capable of dominating the game and controlling right. it. Right? And there's been certain things this season that have really concerned me. So the energy in the Brantford game, this is the first game after the Liverpool game, where it's a must-win game. Where Champions League still within reach if you win this game. The energy was unbelievable it was really poor and then i remembered the home game against fc copenhagen in the champions league where it was a must-win game where united had lost four three away to Bayern munich and thrown a game away against galatasaray this is a game you have to win yeah. and the first half in that game was atrocious just no intensity no energy really flat no real desire to win the game um it was played like a pre-season friendly and there's been so many times this season where you expect a reaction. You know, you expect a desire and intensity to win, and you don't get it. Look at the contrast between the first half yesterday and the second half. How is it possible that you can be that bad in one half of football yeah. and have intensity in the second half that's completely different? What is it that you're not doing at the start of the game that you're changing at halftime? Because I don't understand how you can start a game against Liverpool like that where the first 10 minutes they play okay, Liverpool get control of the game, and then it gets embarrassing, where they yes. look like two teams from a whole different universe, where United couldn't string three passes together. They kept turning possession over, turning possession over, and the amount of chances Liverpool were missing was ridiculous, and these performances keep happening, and then they, they bail out a result um, that um, sort of paper over the cracks. What makes you, you know, even if they win at Brantford, we're having a different discussion. If they win at Chelsea, we're having a different discussion. But mm. the problems would be exactly the same. Right. And so, yeah. Um, yeah, so sometimes you learn, you know, you, you sometimes you have to look at a win in the same way you would look at a defeat. Yeah. Because there's still so many lessons there. I mean, I said this about the Chelsea game, that it was basically two teams playing to lose the game. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it was like two, three year olds building a, a, an atomic bomb. You know, there was just yeah, it was uh, nonsense. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just, there was nobody won that game. In yeah. my opinion, two two bad teams lost it. Yeah. Two teams showed how bad they are. Um, and you know, with Chelsea, you're just, you're trying to figure out why they're this bad, despite spending all this money. Um, United, I can kind of understand why. Um, I, 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 I feel for Ten Hag with injuries that Martinez's situation is ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Um, why was he allowed to go to Argentina? You know, and you know, muscle injuries, James. We'll get into this in a second. Um, yeah. I, I, we'll, we'll finish up talking about this game. No one will want that. Um, to finish up on th this game yesterday, at no point did I think even the 2 1 United were going to win this game. Yeah. You know, I expected that they would concede, and they did. Was it a penalty? Could have went either way. Um, I thought they were unlucky with one of the penalties against Chelsea. 
you know, I thought the Kukurea one where Anthony brought him down was probably not a penalty. Um, and yeah, there's been decisions that have gone against United this season where they've been uh, more egregious than that, where they haven't got a penalty. I mean, the Hoyland at Arsenal, standard, yeah. which yeah. was an obvious penalty. You know, yeah. the Christian Romero one penalty. Um, you know, but uh, still, you know, when you come down to this type of thing, you know, the, the, it's it, where you're relying on refereeing decisions to go your way. Yeah. You know, you, the, you, 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 um, you know, it's not the negative of what the bigger problem is. And how wide open United are is, is truly defies belief. And there's something that Ten Hag has to fix. And like you said before, I'm not against sacking him, James. You know, I just want to make sure that, um, the right things are attributed to him and not the wrong things. And we, we will get into his fitness here, but um, there's been positives too. I think Garnacho has been exceptional. I think uh, obviously the emergence of Kabi Menu, you know, has been a massive plus for United. Uh, I think now you're realizing how big of a loss he was the first half of the season. You know, young Kambuala, you know, showing yesterday there's a center back in him. And I think Dallo has been exceptional. This season for United. Um, I thought Maguire was immense yesterday. Yeah, um, yeah. Really yeah. incredible. I have a lead humble pie on Big Maguire because I was one of his biggest critics. I think we've seen a significant improvement on Onana. A um, little bit concerned about the drop off of Hoyland, but because um, he's been poor, let's be honest. He mm -hmm. should have scored. Yeah, I think he was pretty bad. But yeah. I understand he's not getting a lot of service, but he hasn't been good. Um, I didn't like his reaction when he was brought off against Chelsea. Um, but yeah, there's been some positives too. But you you can see that this summer, I mean, they badly need legs in midfield. But um, yeah. anything else to say on those games? No, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, there's not a lot you can take away from it that you didn't know before, unfortunately. Yeah. And we're, and I think that's kind of what I expect for the rest of the season. I'm not sure we're going to learn anything new, but uh, I'm hoping it continues. At least some positives we can take are those young players coming through and more minutes for them under their belt, more minutes for Kavi Menu, more minutes for Willie Kambuala, I hope, which probably, given the injury situation at center back, probably will. And um, hopefully that, that we can you know, see because that would be some good things. One last point I want to make on this. Listening to Ten Hag, he seems really confident in his position. As if someone has been communicating to him that your position is not under threat. Ten Hag could very easily finish eighth or ninth this season. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. unacceptable if you get a match. I don't care what yeah. situation you're dealing with. And you should not expect to keep your job yeah. if you yeah. finish eighth or ninth. No Manchester United manager in the current era should be finishing eight or ninth. That's unacceptable. And I don't want him to be that confident. I want him to feel a little bit of a concern, a bit of pressure to improve because no one has a divine right to keep this job. You yeah. Know, right, but results do matter. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, in, in fairness, I never really believe what managers say publicly almost ever anyway, you know, because if you take Ten Hogg's words, he says we're playing really well. I will give him the benefit of the doubt and say that he's lying about that too. Okay. I don't actually mm -hmm. think he believes that, frankly. I just, managers are funny and what they say publicly and what they say in conferences is always sort of like, you know, it's, it's 90% bullshit and that's all right. That's kind of goes with the territory. I think of is what it is. Um, you know, but at the same time, you know, you can kind of, I, I think you could understand why you feel secure in it. One thing I will say that is totally true and totally correct, and people do need to, to understand this, is that Ineos have never really wanted to make a change midseason. They've been pretty insistent on that from even way before they got in the club. They had no plans to come in and sack the manager midseason. Um, they really, really, not that this is a stable season, but really did not want to destabilize it any more than it already was by coming in here and saying, oh, we're going to get rid of you know, all these people. I mean... And, and they're doing so much elsewhere. They didn't want to come in and say, yeah, we're going to also change the manager and change this. Cause you could end up in an absolutely horrific situation, way worse than eighth or ninth. You come in and change too much mid season and replace managers and things like that. I mean, it, it could get really bad. Well, the other question that it isn't, but who would you replace them with? 
Yeah. Well, and, it's, and why do you spend the money too? Like, let's put it this way. You're thinking of a long-term view, right? Of where you want a, this club to be. You sack Ten Hag mid-season. Why? You, you spend $20 million to do it. You know, then you're going to spend millions to bring someone in for an interim or something. Why? What are you chasing with this season? There's nothing to chase. There's no goal for it. I mean, it's even a, there's even huge arguments against interims in general. Did, did Ralph Rangnick do anything better for the season that we had than if we'd let Ole Gunnar Solskjaer fill it, uh, finish it out before replacing him? I think we probably ended up exactly where we would have ended up anyway, which was, you know, yeah, like seven. That's for you know, I, you know, and I, I, he gets lauded a lot for some of the things that he said, but to me, they were all obvious. Yeah, it's things everybody knows, and and he. Heart you surgery know, illness. Yeah, it's great to say that, but you know, you can't spend the training you know, while you're still on vacation, too. You know, that doesn't quite work. <laughs> but to me, like there was nothing profound there. No. You know, like of course you needed need open heart surgery. Of course you <clears> send <throat> players. It's you know, it's derivative of you know, a style that you want to implement yeah. and you send players based on that. And we know that United haven't been doing that. I mean, maybe yeah. it's refreshing to see someone in that position to actually state the obvious, but... Um, we all know it. Yeah, and we all said, know that wasn't going to happen under the Glazers too, so... Of course. Um, most of what he said was pretty obvious. Um, but nonetheless, you, you, you're correct in that, you know, it's a, you know, it's a sugar high. It does, it's great for a little bit, yeah. but... There's also the fact that you have to send a message to these players that they can't keep getting managers sacked. Yeah, but, um, I agree. That you know, if a manager goes, they're not, it's not just his failure; it's a collective failure team too. Yeah. Um, and one thing that <clears throat> that may not seem this way, United are in the best position today that they've been in the last twenty years, or maybe mm-hmm. sourced, at least in the last ten since Ferguson left, in the sense that there's no accountability for this because this cycle would have continued ad nauseum under the Glazers, right? Where incremental improvement failure, incremental improvement failure. Now I am any also putting people in place that saying there's consequences for this and they're being properly evaluated by football people. You know, you heard Russell Martin talk at the weekend say that Jason Wilcox most likely will go to Manchester United. So that is very close to being done. Um and they're putting the team in place that uh can make these proper eva- assessments and evaluations and the other thing is, James, if you replace Ten Hag, do you go out and get somebody that wants to coach with exactly like Ten Hag with the same concept? Or do you rip this up and, and, and start again and, and go after different players? Um, lastly, on that Ten Hag, but I will say, and you, you bring it up, uh, the two signings that I don't understand are Mason Mount and Anthony. Yeah. And, and why, you know, Anthony was saying when they still have Ronaldo, Ten Hag wanted to get rid of him that summer, but United didn't want to spend the money on a replacement at that time. And it wasn't that easy untangling Ronaldo from United. But they could have done with a striker, not a winger. And Mason, yeah. Mount, when you're managing resources where you don't have a lot, I still don't understand how you can spend 60 million on Mount when I'm still trying to understand what obvious position he fills. Um, even if he's fit every week, I'm trying to understand where does he fit in this team. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. they can't afford to be spent 130, 40 million on two players that you're not sure how they fit. Although I thought Anthony probably had his best game since Barcelona. Um in with Chelsea, right? Yeah. So he played really, really well. Then gets dropped. Mm-hmm. Mad hasn't kicked the ball for United since he scored a goal against Liverpool. I know. Well, you know, just on that slight thing, you know, we were talking about just to come back to something we discussed on the on the on the transfers a little bit ago. We were talking about that right wing position, and I think that's still why when you look at it, there's there's it's going to be hard to claim that Anthony has any consistency, and then you know, I had the same thing with a lot of people yeah. asking, "Hey, look at Ahmad kicked on." Well. We don't need a winger anymore, but he hasn't played a minute since then. There's obviously a reason for that. I'm not going to say that he should be playing. I'm not going to say I know better on that front. There's clearly a belief he's just he's not up to the level of the, the players who are on the pitch, you know? And so they still need more options because it is still threadbare up front, especially when it comes to actual goal threat and creation of chances and things like that, no doubt. So well, forward will be a big issue as well this summer. I mean, it, just on the Anthony thing, it looks like Garnacho has that right wing spot. I agree. Like, uh, I agree. So what do you do with Anthony? Anthony played exceptional against Chelsea. Um, Marcus Rashford came off injured. Uh, he's been carrying an injury since mm-hmm. Bart. Um, so, 
And I know that he's not entirely thrilled with the fact that this year he has to play in, uh, behind deeper than the central striker, which he didn't have to do last yeah. season. Uh, you know, Margish had some big decisions to make over the next couple of months. Nonetheless, let's move this conversation on um, because one of the hot topics last week was um, fitness and is Ten Hag and his training methods uh, too intense? Um, is it uh, resulting in non-contact injuries? And um, depends on who you ask, depends on what answer you get. Um so, you know, I've, I've speak to other people in professional sports who you know, are professional athletes at the very highest level. And, you know, they're, you know, I'll give boxers, for example, you know, the guy in the corner is not the guy that handles their fitness, strength and conditioning. These are all, they have nutritionists, they chefs, they have professionals in every aspect of fitness to give them, forgive me for using this term, marginal gains, right? <laughs> um so it's a very detailed sports science, um, precise process. And that's the way it should be. Now, United have had fitness coaches leave and not get replaced. I don't know the depth of their staff. They obviously have Michael Clegg, their strength and conditioning coach. Mm -hmm. And typically how it works at clubs is managers don't handle the individual fitness plans of players it's usually a yeah. consequence of sports science departments who calibrate this based on players physiology their age their previous injury record you know um their their muscle type the position that they play all these different things that tailor you know that, that, that go into tailoring these programs obviously johnny evans is not doing the same fitness program as copy mining you have to manage those different um you seem uh, you be or have information that Ten Hag is managing that, and I don't know whether that's a criticism of him or whether that's a criticism of the club. Because if he's made yeah. like a doctor, you know, expect failures. Um, <laughs> but uh, but if you look at you know its injury list, James, in comparison to the other clubs, because we're looking at this, it's actually pretty average, right? I mean, if you look at uh, you know, we're missing eight first team players last week when I was looking at this. In comparison to Palace of nine, Newcastle of eleven, you know, Chelsea of ten, I think, um, you know, Liverpool of eight. Uh, you know, going through the number of, I think Arsenal only won. Um, mm. And, and today was, they're you know, fully fit, their whole team, which is crazy. Yeah, so we're looking at this and going, you know, a lot of it is. The same players repetitive injuries. Mm -hmm. it's all yes. I mean, the Malasia situation is backbone. Mm -hmm. The Sandra Martinez situation is totally unacceptable. Um, and that is something that you need to have to get to the bottom of. Yeah, well, I think it is very much multifaceted. Like th this this issue is multifaceted. And so, you know, when you bring up that, you know, yeah, my information is that Ten Hag very much oversees all of these things. No, it doesn't mean he's sitting down with somebody and it shouldn't be taken that way, right? That he's sitting down with a player and saying, you're going to, you know, do this much exercise on the bike and this much on the running thing. And then you lift this weight. Um, but he has had an influence on things like their eating diets, uh, structure, the timings of their, of the plans, things like that. Um, he is somebody who likes to have a lot of control and has, has, has a lot of control over these areas and likes to be involved in those things. Um, it's another one of those things where it's like, there should be a lot more structure there, right? Um, there was a good article that, from, from James Duggar to Telegraph. They have fitness people, but there isn't someone running the fitness area for all the players that's scheduling training. That's, you know, deciding on rest days versus this days. That's all done by the manager. And that's not necessarily the case at many other clubs where they have performance directors, which I think is what Ineos are intending to bring in, is a performance director who's going to be the person who's arranging, you know, training days, training times, how much, when the breaks are, when the rests are, you know, the, the intensity kind of of certain aspects um, around games and, and working that all out alongside a very, you know, heavy amount of data. So, you know, that's one aspect where it needs massive improvement because, it's been different. Every manager that comes in has their own different ideas. And I listened to a whole thing from the training ground guru on this topic, or really uh, 
you know, that's a really good account or news organization, whatever it is that they exactly do. But they talk to a lot of sporting directors. They're really good on all of this. And I had this, this, this with the training ground guru. That's what they are on Twitter. Mm. Um, they're, but they, they, they do like conferences and things and they have a whole lot of content from sporting directors directly mm -hmm. people who in 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 the game director from the training ground and there was a there was one club they were talking about that was sort of on the advancement on the on the data and the science part of it and they said look yeah managers come in and they kind of mess up your plans a little bit they all do um, they come in and mess up you know the plans a little bit because they always have to be thinking yeah i want to train on this and i want to be doing this from sure. a football standpoint of course they're going to that's natural um and so it is, it's a, it's an overall problem where, you know, I'd heard early in the season that there was a lot of ways where United are not set up and how they organize, you know, their rest versus training versus game days and how that is all set up to where players are going into games exhausted, too tired. Um, and there's, there's a lot of issues that go to it and it's not 10 hogs fall. This is where, you know, people can take it a little bit too much in that respect because, they're all going to have their own ideas on how to train, on how to run, on how to things like that. When when Ollie came in, there was a lot of injuries too. And, you know, this is something where it, it's failed for a long, long time uh, at letting, at getting the right structure in place. Similar to recruitment, you have these same issues in training and in performance where you, where you want experts handling each individual thing fully. And it takes the pressure off the manager and it also provides them with better data. They're not going to complain if they have fitter players. They're not going to complain if they have people who are able to run more, play harder, do all of that, um, you know, by giving them the right structure. So that's that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it that I think is really important to, to understand is that, you know, when you do look how we play relative to the level of the Premier League, and this is an adjustment that I think Ten Hag's made. Last year, we played a really compact kind of a bit slower way of, of, of style of playing. And it, it, it certainly worked better getting results. The midfield was closer. The gaps were smaller. Everything was a little bit lower. In preseason of his first season, it was actually a little more similar to this. And if this plan is going to work, if what he's doing right now is going to work, if it has any chance of working, it needs athletes of the highest caliber in these positions, right? So you look at, like we talk about Casemiro, you're seeing his slowdown in the late latter stages of, career, of his career exposed massively in this system because where you have Casemiro, you need someone who is incredibly athletic at this point in time, fast, physical, able to cover immense amounts of, of ground. And you need that across the board. So you see someone like Willie Kampuala come in and he can do a, have a great performance because he's incredibly athletic, very physical. And the way I understood it was that, you know, Ten Hag really wanted to push the levels up there and, um, and demand more physically and athletically from his players for the system. Now, we can debate and everybody can debate whether that's a good idea or not, whether the system will ever work or not, no matter what players you put into it, whether it's made for the Premier League, all of that is who knows. That's why you have to back a manager or not, right, is to is to say we believe in your ideas and we're going to give you what you need to accomplish it. Um, so that's in question. But what is not in question is there are very few players who are up for it. There are very few players who can meet the demands of it, right? Um, there are very few players who, once they really started pushing in this direction, could continue there and could make it. And so the injuries ramp up, the, the flaws show up, the, the difficulties show up, and then a few people stand out. So when you look at like someone like Yogo Dalo, who's had a really good season, his physicality has been fantastic. His athleticism, his ability to run 90 minutes up and down and to get into challenges and to do the things that he can do. It's physicality that that you note there. Garnacho has started how many games now? Thirty in a row? Or is it more? Um, and he's only and he's now starting to have to sub him because he's clearly getting tired. Finally, uh, he's starting to sub him a little bit earlier each game. You know, Marcus Rashford was also somebody who was playing up to that level for a long time. The concerning part of it is is even the players that are that were kind of meeting these levels are now starting to kind of fall apart. Scott McTominay picked up an injury. 
Uh, Rashford's slowing down. Definitely has picked up an injury. And, um, you know, it, it's it's a problem. But this this has been an issue at United, I think, for a very, very long time from a recruitment standpoint, is that they do not pick up and sign players who are physical. We've, we've signed a lot of older players. Christian Eriksen uh, can't even make it on the pitch anymore. He's not playing at all. One season in Casemiro, obviously, we've seen, you know, um, uh, Ronaldo was slowing down a lot by the time he made it to United, uh, especially by that second season. Uh, it's happened so many times, right, um, that they've signed players who are towards the tail end of their career. The technical traits are still there, but the physicality is is gone. And um, and that really is the main thing that is is there, is that the physical levels that are being demanded by training, by the style of play and all of that are not being met by many of the players. So I'll sit there and say, I don't know if this is the best idea. I think that it's probably would have been better to maybe adapt it a bit more, get more compact to prevent the season from going totally off the rails with injuries. But at the same time, in the long run, no matter who comes in, the club is going to need to replace so many players to bring that level of physicality up to a competitive standard for the Premier League because we are way below Liverpool, Arsenal, and City in this area. There's no doubt about it that this team does not have the physical capabilities to compete with them as as athletes. And I really mean that as, as athletes. Well, one of the things about the club, Guardiola still playing, is you have to refresh that squad every three yes. years. Right? Yes. Because they, they have burnout. And yes, um, that is one of the things that's well known with that style of football is that you have the same players that are, you know, that, that are similar to the ones you're selling, but um, can contain a physical level. Because if you look at, you know, Klopp, his declines come usually within three years of each other. Right, mm -hmm. never finished. Mm -hmm. You know, finished above him three times in six years. He has that one year decline. Refresh, go again. You know, haven't ever done that. I mean, the squad that they're putting out every week. Some of these players go back to Van Hal. You know, yeah. and so not only are they not capable of playing the way that the manager wants, they don't have the physical attributes to be able to do it. Um, and you know, you've got players that are constantly injured that shouldn't be at the football club, but you know, they still count them as squad players. I mean, this is this is correct. It's a collective failure. Um, you know, Ten Hag took over a football club that um, the Glazers were trying to sell. They weren't investing for the future. They weren't trying to put, uh, you know, band aids as the Americans call it. Yeah. Going yeah. You know, it's just you know, fix the puncture and tire, put a put a patch on it, and be done. Just as long as we get this thing on the road. And so you know are going to have to start executing better planning and how they go after players and what they're you know beyond the fact that this is an agent calling up and offering a player oh he'll do he's a bit good he'll sell shirts there has yeah. to be proper planning executed um you know what obviously i don't know what the right answer is do you compromise your principles um or do you not you know do you you know if you remember when Solskjaer came in one of the first things he said was you know weren't fit yeah um and um and he'd always say well, robust right he wanted well, them to be robust he's the best team in the league yeah, was one of the yeah. first things he said and so you know antonio conte is notorious for being someone that is you know a fanatical on the fitness levels of his players remember when lukaku went there then to milan one of the first things he told lukaku is you weren't fit um when he came from united to enter milan and uh Lukaku was shocked. He had to lose weight. Um, you know, had to, he had to completely change his physicality. I remember Ronaldo saying that United you know, players were unprofessional in training, with some of their attitudes were being asked to up their standards, and they didn't want to. But I don't know what the right answer is here. Um, you know, fitness conditioning is not incredibly complex because. You know, it's pretty well known science. What isn't well known is the threshold between picking up an injury and also injury and not. There's obviously certain indicators. You know, you can't, or, you know, I remember when Luke Shaw came back, he played three games in a week. Yeah. You, know, you can't change loads that fast because, you know, players have to be gradually built up to that where they can tolerate that. And I can see that that's what they're trying to do with Mount. Yeah. Um, but, um, 
and I actually I think it was a mistake to bring him on against Chelsea because he got the crowd back into the game and uh, was playing the crowd a bit more than the game. And uh, but I can understand why he is you know trying to incrementally bring him um, bring him on. Um, but even with Hoyland, you know the the low change is massive when he comes back. So I don't know what the right answer is, um, but it's something that's played United managers for the longest time. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's uh, it, it it for me is the that right there could get Ten Hag the sack. I mean, I, I'm if you never had Sean and 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 Martinez this season, there's no question they'd be in a better position than what they are. Um, you know, the Martinez injury fact that he's missed most of the season this is a big problem i'm, I'm starting mm -hmm. to see shades of gabriel and say mm -hmm. in in martinez where will he ever recover and be the player that he was you know this is a long time for you to be out so now you keep picking up injuries niggly injuries that, that, that extend that period of time and yeah. very rarely do you come back a better player than what you were before your injury and most of this was avoidable the first surgery was not handled properly malasia was not handled i mean this is just unforgivable incompetence you don't see this anywhere else teams you don't hear this anywhere else you don't hear players complaining that they're getting injured because of intensity and training you don't hear players complain you know players having to get repeated surgeries because they keep getting botched um you know constant injuries to players player comes back after being out for you know months then goes away for international duty plays for his international team comes back plays 20 minutes from he's injured again like what, what is this, this, uh, is this i mean you know these native fans deserve proper answers over that um anyway so um lastly uh let's take a look ahead to their up and coming games of course um like you say i i don't i said this when United you know, lost Luke Shaw that I never expected to qualify for the Champions League. I think that left back position is a major problem. Three of Chelsea's goals come from the left back position. And I think that teams exploit United in that position. I don't know why Bruno Fernandes ends up in that position so many times in a game. I like the goal against Fulham came from Bruno Fernandes being caught in the left, left back position. The goal against Liverpool in the FA Cup came against Bruno Fernandes being caught in the left back position. Um, it's a major, major weakness. I never expected him to qualify for the Champions League. Um, so what now for the rest of the season? Yeah, well, I think you know, the Champions League side of things is, is very much gone at this point, right? It's 11 points back, and it's not just so much that I mean, 11 points is a lot to make up one way or another, right? No matter what even though Aston Villa have been poor. But, you know, Aston Villa have, have won one in their last five, so have United. And um, and the issue is that the, the games you could think, well, we might be, be able to pick up some points. We don't. You know, there's no confidence that we're going to win those games that, that we could to pick up points. And so, you know, I, I think you kind of forget about that. Um, I wouldn't even look past Coventry at this point in time. They're a good team. And you know, in the FA Cup and say, oh yeah, it's a guaranteed win to the FA Cup final at this point because it's the exact type of game they'll that they can mess up. You know, it, it it's hard. I, I don't know what you do in sort of a dead rubber like this, uh, a dead rubber season in this respect, where, where you focus on. I do think that it would be the priority of management that they still are in Europe, though. I think mm -hmm. that would be a huge oh, yeah, really need to be in Europe. I mean, it's not no money being in the Europa League. You know, it's less than the Champions League, but it's not none. Well, they need and to you, play two games. You know, yeah. The, you know, the, the players need their games. I, I agree. And, you know, look, you, you, there's a, people people look at it like, I'd rather be out of Europa. And there's a benefit to it, I, I can see. But if they're really planning to do a full retool of the team and – focus on young players and all of that, you need the games for them. You need a lot of games for them to play or you end up with an unhappy squad. You need a lot of ability to, to work them in and you need those games. But in addition, you know, you, you have wage cuts for missing the Champions League. You don't get wage cuts for missing Europa League. You don't get that big 25% wage savings. So you're talking about a PSR thing. You just lose, you know, tens of millions in revenue by missing out on Europe entirely. And so there's a couple of ways to qualify for it. Obviously, finishing the league position as well as winning the FA Cup, or I think getting second in the FA Cup if the 
team that wins is in the Champions League, right? Is when another way in. You never been in the Europa League. Those are the seasons they qualified by the Champions League. They're good right? seasons, yeah. I mean, yeah, Jose won it. Yeah. Is it hurting them right now? No. You know, and you needed need to get to have that rhythm of, you know, yeah. game, midweek, game, midweek, yeah. game. Um, and and uh, for some of these younger players, you know, the squad, be one of the reasons why they cut the squad in January is because they didn't have the game. Yeah. So, um, no, it's important that they're in Europe. And yeah. that's what I'm saying. Like, to me, if Ten Hag finished, finished outside of the European positions, you, you, regardless of all the mitigation, you'd be really hard pushed to try to defend that. You know, yeah. 12 defeats already this season is, is to me, unacceptable. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'd support him, you know, with my views on it. Not um, unconditionally. Yeah. I support Manchester United. Personally, I, I wouldn't care if Kenny Douglas was a manager as long as he never won trophies. Right? To me, who said Douglas is more or less relevant to me. Yeah. Um, I'm just sick of the same cycle, you know. Blaming, You're a Southgate, you'd be good. Uh, What's that? You're a Southgate, you'd be good? No. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't want him, but if he was winning trophies, I'd be fine. I wouldn't yeah. say I'd pick Douglas for Southgate because I, I don't think they would win trophies. I'm just making the point that if Southgate... No, no, I know, I know. I personally wouldn't care, you know, but no, I would not want Gareth Southgate. I think if you look at Guardiola and Klopp, beyond the fact that they're exceptional managers, they have big personality. Mm -hmm. Their their personality is dominant, and they they project the nerve confidence. Yep. They you know Graham Potter, for example, is the opposite. You know, very good coach, but too timid. Doesn't have that little jagged edge to him. Mm -hmm. You know, Mourinho. If you look at Ferguson, all these great coaches had that jagged edge to them. Yeah. Or Southgate to me, you know, has three different moods: gray, dark gray, and light gray. Right, and that's it. And to yeah. me, I think as a United manager, you have to have personality. You have to have a certain air about you that um, gets under people's skin, you know, that annoys people. You know, that's one of the things that Klopp and Guardiola does really well. One of the things that Ferguson did really well is that you're very good at manipulating the media, your 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 whole persona, and that players feed off that. You know, they feed yeah. off the personality of their manager, you know, they, 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 they read your body language. And I don't think yeah. Gareth Southgate gives me that, you know, I'm with you. That edge. I don't, I don't, yeah. I just don't think I, I wouldn't want to let you know. Yeah. But, I'm with but, you. but at the same time, I can't identify an obvious replacement for Ten Hag that jumps out at me. It says, you didn't have to have him. You know, I know people talk about Nagelsmann not there, but still, I think you'd be concerned just just on that note. I think I don't think that necessarily Nagelsmann fits into the idea that Ineos have for the manager position at United in terms of how they're structuring it. Um, yeah, I don't think he does in that respect, and I think it's one of the reasons why it's not been more talked about as an option. Hmm. Uh, I'm not sure he's interested in that job. Yeah, well, I don't know, and that's the thing is that I just. I think, you know, when people talk about coaches, people have a tendency to overrate, like Zerbi, I think, yeah. decent coach, but maybe a bit overrated. Right? Um, and to me, uh, people underestimate how important personality is. And mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. when you go through rough periods, there has to be something that gives fans confidence that you're capable uh, and players of getting yourself through this and how you project yourself. You know, the, you know the, your personality has a lot to do with that. And I think that is in a top job, really, really important. But anyway, we will leave it there, mate. Um, thanks as always. Thanks to all of you for downloading the podcast, for all the followers, retweets. And um, I want to thank my good friend, Miguel Delaney, for spending two hours with me yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Being with me. I love dearly. Miguel's a very good friend of mine. Um, but um, And thanks to all of you who take the time to get in touch with us. James, take it easy, mate. Enjoy your week. Yes, you too. Thank you all. Cheers, folks.